religious, um, and the panel will look at exploring the various uh, emerging views um, on how best to approach uh, this problem. Uh, as you will be aware, some countries have gone a criminal law road in, in this uh, problem, but critics of, of, of that approach argue that criminal law would have been the most appropriate solution to that could be privacy issues or civil liberties solutions and victims and uh, sometimes but they often all they want is for the uh, images to be taken down rather than uh, going the road. But there are a range of uh, <coughs> issues there. I should have probably told you who I am. My name is Tom Ashnaev, I'm based in um, University of Stuttgart and uh, the panel we have here is um, sitting to my left, left here is Laura Higgins from the UK State Internet Centre. Uh, to the is um, Colin Jacob from the Cyber Civil Rights Initiative uh, for the United States. And um, Lawrence would be uh, Lawrence Sully from the University of Luxembourg would be our uh, moderator for the session. To my right is uh, Michelle Shaw uh, from the Khan University. And last but by no means uh, is Steve Gagne from the Gagne University uh, in, uh, in the United States. So uh, quite a uh, you know, thing to uh, diverse. Speakers today, I think we should provide for an interesting uh, discussion. Um, I think we'll get the speakers to speak first, right, and then um, leave the uh, question and answer session at the end. We would very much welcome inputs and comments and questions uh, from the audience. Okay, so the first speaker is Thank you. Um, hello, everyone. Thank you for the session. I hope it's interesting for you. We are fairly short on time, so as well as the questions afterwards, if you do see me and you have any learning questions for me, come and grab me over coffee. Um, so can I just quickly check, has everyone in this room had the time of Enterprise? Can I have a quick show of hands if you have? So most people are familiar with that term. Um, as Abhilash said, it's something we're a little uncomfortable with as people working in this field, but we are yet to come up with a better term that really sums up what it is. Um, it's always a, a, a challenge for us when we need to pick up on something as topical as this, and as, from their point of view, it's sensational as this. Um, and of course, the more that the term is being used, the more the people are recognising it. So I think we're stuck with it for the foreseeable. But what we're actually talking about here is um, generally we're talking about adults, we're not talking about children, that's a slightly different issue. So we're talking about um, the pictures themselves are not illegal. Um, but it is um, a very unpleasant act of people posting images without the consent of the person in sexual um, So I work for the Safer Internet Centre in the UK. We're funded by the European Commission um, as part of the Safer Internet program. And we deliver three strands of work, awareness raising, a helpline, and a hotline which deals with the illegal content. Um, we do not specialise in this area. However, it has fallen upon us because there is nobody else currently in the UK who can do exactly what we do. Um, this is just a sample of some of the media that we have done, or I have done, in the last six months. And I do mean this as a sample. We are doing pretty much daily interviews, and the majority of it is about the to call. Now, my helpline is actually there for people who work with children to really support the police, social workers, schools, and so on. Um, we didn't realise we were really seeing this as an issue, but when we went back and started seeing a kind of increase in these calls, people who were originally calling us about this were teachers and social workers and police officers who themselves were victims. So this is not a silly young girl who took some pictures. This is professionals, this is normal people like you and I. Um, I think that the amount of media that we have just shows the interest in this and it's not going away. So the challenge has been about how do we use this um, opportunity to talk about it to, to kind of turn it on its head. We want to give safety messages. We want to send a clear message. This is not acceptable. We try not to get involved in the very sensational stories. And I'm sure many of you understand uh, the UK media particularly. Um, they love this kind of story. Um, what we do with the secret of our success in the UK is our partnerships with the internet industry. So all of the people here um, are people who we actually have a name in the list, we have a, a person that we can go and talk to about cases. They also keep us updated on their policies, which means that when somebody calls us with an online safety issue, first thing we can do is empower them to try and resolve it themselves, and most of the time that works. But sometimes we know things are so complex um, or sometimes the reporting may not pick up on some of the subtleties of the issue, in which case we can then go direct to these organisations on their behalf, 
to assist in the takedown of content. Now you can see very clearly with revenge pornography why that would be a really useful thing. Um, Holly's going to be talking a little more about some of the practical stuff around this, um, but, but certainly for us, a lot of this content does appear on these sites. So, what I'm talking about, where is it? So these images, yes, there are some rather unpleasant sites who specialise in posting this content. Uh, you can see the one in the middle is more <coughs> usual, and it actually pays people for content that they then put on the site. Um, they um, have, so probably many of you will have heard of myx.com, particularly unpleasant. It has thousands and thousousands of profiles of victims, both male and female on there. Many of you still don't even know that they're on there. Um, there was also a very unpleasant issue around um, the optimization of this within search engines. Holly and I were discussing yesterday, we were going to go away and try and tackle this, but unfortunately, uh, the idea of revenge pornography is not just to post the pictures, it's about driving the traffic to that content to cause humiliation and distress to the victims. So they will link it to your Facebook, they will link it to your LinkedIn account. Um, we've dealt with cases where it's been posted on, um, it's been shared with people's local tourist information or their work websites. Um, and so some of these are real challenges. But other than that, the content is also in quite mainstream places. So the challenge is about working with them, about how do they reduce the risk of that happening and the efficacy of their reporting. So that when we say to them, this has been posted without that person's consent, that they can very speedily get taken down and also assist in um, prosecutions and law enforcement. So Anne and I B, this is um, <coughs> probably one of the most challenging places we have to deal with this. Um, it is called Anne and I B is image board. So it's basically an anonymous image board People hide behind this anonymity and they make up usernames or less very hard without police involvement to find out who is behind it. Um, it's very much like an old school kind of um, chat room type thing where you have threads and people then post and they trade images. And they will seek out individuals. So they will say, it, it works on a local area. So they will say, okay, in Brussels, has anyone got pictures of this girl? And it might just be a normal picture of her in the pub. Somebody says, I know her, yes, yeah, she went out so and so. And then piece by piece, they manage to find pictures and they share them and they sell them. And they sell them for Bitcoin and they sell them for cash and they trade them for more images. Um, a lot of the content on here is um, images of minors. So, of course, we're having a challenge in terms of law enforcement and ensuring that they are dealt with appropriately. Um, but again, <coughs> there is this element that we would think of as kind of standard revenge porn where they will say, oh, if you want to see some more pictures of her, here's her password for her YouTube account. Here is her, um, you know, I've managed to hack her photo, but I'll get his link to it. Um, so it really is very unpleasant. It has been shut down several times. And so this is an ongoing challenge for us. Where it's going next? So we're heading for Tor, the dark web. Um, Pink Meth was one of the early hosts of this content. Um, and they were very proud of it. And um, our good friends, Anonymous, were quite successful in uh, disrupting their service enough that they were closed down, um, but not for long. They kept coming back, and it was almost this kind of game that happened for them, but it was very funny to say, oh, we're back, we're back. Um, and now they are now using um, kind of Anonymous routine ways to post the content. Um, there are obviously issues around this. If we do decide to go down law enforcement routes, it's very difficult when, once it goes on to the kind of the hidden web to, to identify people behind it. But the benefit for us goes back to this optimization. And actually, if it's on the dark web, it's not going to be harassing the victim to the same way <coughs> it's constantly coming up on Google search. So um, I think that's what to watch it, certainly when I know that law enforcement in the UK are really familiar to so this is from our point of view, as I say at the moment, our helpline is not a dedicated manager for the helpline. We are hopeful that that is something that's going to happen. Um, but at the moment, we are there, we are a very specialised helpline for children's workforce. We still have 117 calls. When I do any media, we do not publish our phone number, or our website, or our email. These are victims who literally have nowhere else to turn. Or they are being given our details by the police, or social workers or their support advocates because they know that we can try and assist them. Um, so just since last year, we've had 23 cases um, and one of those was so complex. It's taken 18 years for the past and then we're still trying to unpick it. Um, this person actually was a victim of the snapping Snapchat incident. 
last year, and he is a young television celebrity in the UK. So you can imagine, well as human eyes, right to privacy, well as quite powerful and effective in moving to content, because he is in the public eye. He seemed to lose the right to the privacy, even though he had in no way designed for these images to get around the public eye. So we are still trying to remove that content. I think viral is probably the best way to, uh, to put it. But it's interesting, again, you know, um, I think it's going to come up in some of discussion, but for male, male female, we are seeing a huge increase now. When we go on to these sites, we're seeing more and more male profiles, but they're not coming forward for help. I think that will hopefully change, but I think there's a challenge for us in our messaging and our targeting of audiences. The fact that we have only had four males contacts, and yet when we're seeing the content that's on the channel, um, we, we're working with a, um, an LGBT support organisation in the UK, and they have told us that this is a real issue in, 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 in sexual relationships, particularly. Um, if you imagine how a lot of those relationships start, particularly in the dating scene around that and online dating, no longer do you send a nice headshot to somebody to introduce yourself, you probably send a body shot. Therefore, you've already put these images out. You can see why it's very easy to use. So, I'm going to talk through two cases. These both happened last week. This is how current we are. Um, so, this young lady phoned. She had um, met somebody online nine years ago. They shared some intimate <coughs> images both ways. She met <coughs> up with him once, and that's it. End of story. It didn't hit it off, forgotten. Nine years later, absolutely no reason, he posted these pictures onto myex.com. Since then, and unbeknown to this person, she has got into another relationship which turned very violent and aggressive. She was moved for her own protection by a domestic abuse organisation. This person has now managed to post her full details and where she lives and her age onto the site. So you can imagine there is this increased risk to her. He linked it to the Facebook, as is common behaviour with this behaviour. The first thing she knows about it is a multitude of messages from unknown men. Very interesting behaviour. They were coming at her writing horrible, filthy things, which is something we've normally seen, that this is what I'd like to do to you, which is obviously very unpleasant. They were even being slightly more sinister, saying, well, we're very worried about you. Did you know that these photos were online? Or, you know, we'd love to help you with this. Complete strangers. It was very bizarre and quite intimidating for her with her other issues. Um, so this this has carried on for some time. She tried to get help. Nobody knew what to do. Eventually, she went to the police, and the police's response was ignoring the fact she's you know in hiding effectively. Um, well, there's not really a lot we can do because the new revenge porn in the revenge porn law in the UK isn't in effect yet. Uh, what about <coughs> harassment and what about malicious communications? Or, no, that's all been disregarded because now they're coming out, well, there's this new law, but it's not here. So that's very disempowering and incorrect, of course. So we are now working with the police on this with her. And the second thing that they advised her was to pay myx.com to take the pictures down, which is a really helpful service that they used to offer. They're currently not offering the service, thankfully. And the victim did say to me, that didn't really sound like a very good idea, so she hasn't. Um, in our experience, when they still used to happen, for I think it was $400, they would put you to a third party site who would manage your reputation for you. The images would disappear for a very short period and then would very quickly be re uploaded and you don't have an understanding. So, yes, there are some great um, reputation management sites, but don't go directly to them. Um, so this is one that, that's still ongoing, we're now working with the police. From our point of view, it's quite a straightforward case and quite typical of the sorts of behaviour. Um, we are quite hopeful that we will be, I mean certainly the Facebook stuff has been resolved, she's now very private and can't be found, um, but we're obviously working on the other issues with the police. <coughs> one of my arguments, and again why the whole revenge porn title doesn't work very well, a lot of the people we support, it was not actually committed by an ex-partner, so it wasn't really revenge in that sense, um, and it wasn't even porn because perhaps it wasn't a cell thing. So we have dealt with, for example, people having their, you know, phone goes in to be repaired and they've had their images downloaded, or they've had their laptops hacked and photos stolen. <coughs> this one came in, we're still working on it. This lady's in her 50s, terribly upset. You can imagine the shame of somebody at that age. You know, this, 
she wouldn't dream of taking a selfie and sharing it with somebody. This is a different generation. Um, absolutely devastated. People in her local community just started being very strange around her and were saying things like, how could a woman of your age do that? And she had no idea what they were talking about. <coughs> it actually transpired that the neighbour who she had a long-standing dispute with had made peepholes through the wall, who drilled through the wall and had been filming into her bedroom. Obviously she had, you know, been carrying out sex act on herself and he had got this footage. Now, she didn't know where the footage was, she'd never seen it, but clearly other people knew about it. We still haven't found, and even we work with our partners at the Internet Watch Foundation who have the best technology in finding images online. We can't find it. So the only thing we can conclude is that it's via something like a WhatsApp or a Kick Messenger, and that he has set up a dedicated local group where he is kind of trying to defame her. Um, but there's still this element of the harassment, the fact that people are then telling her, and it's this sort of teasing thing. She, she's obviously anticipating the worst. Um, again, went to the police, police came, police confirmed and said, yes, those are clearly peak holes. They still haven't done anything. There was no support around, you know, they're looking at the case, so there's always things that happen to the holes, we'll look at that, we'll have a bit of a word. And effectively, he's been given a warning. There was nothing that they're doing about the actual fact that this content might be online somewhere and this harassment is happening because they don't really understand it. <coughs> I think that you know, there's a lot of work needs to be done generally in consistency of approach and training and support for law enforcement and fair prosecution and how to handle these cases. <coughs> it's still such a new thing and we haven't got the experience of saying that was really effective. And even when people do go to court, the sentences that they're given are very so widely. You know, we have one case within the southwest region where I'm based, where um, actually the police officer contacted me and he said, I'm so frustrated. <coughs> the perpetrator has uh, um, admitted the harassment. He's admitted that he's been posting these pictures on my ex. They've actually managed to get the content removed, so that was wonderful. We're going to prosecution and he said, I know he's going to go to court and he's going to get a community sentence and walk out of that door. But the effect it's had on this girl, she has lost her job. She's split up with her partner. She, her life is ruined. It doesn't feel fair. And we had this discussion, and he was saying, have you got any ideas? What else can we do to, to make it more robust? And actually, they wrote a victim impact statement, which the judge read out in court. And, and he did get a short custodial sentence. It was short. It was about six weeks. But it's still custodial, which for us was significant. And the judge said, for me, the thing we all need to start to wake up to is that he used the internet as a weapon. And I just thought that was so impactful. And I think if we can take that forward now, that is what they're doing in these sorts of cases. So one thing that's quite often um, a challenge for us, I've talked about UK media, I'm sure many of you have seen it. Um, this is such a dual problem <coughs> that they're, being, they're using it in the wrong way. So it's very difficult for us to say, well, yes, this is a real issue, and it's a growing issue, and it's very serious, and we want to raise awareness. We want people to come forward and feel they're not the only one. But at the same time, when we've got, you know, it being used in inappropriate ways, you know, this young lady that's at the top, Lauren Goodger, she's on a reality TV show. No, she, <coughs> this was not revenge porn. She, she took some photos and a video with her partner, and he showed a few people on his phone. I mean, that's sexting, it's a different thing. But because this term exists now, the media are using it inappropriately. So it's going to be a challenge for us continuing um, <coughs> around how do we do the correct messaging. But we are getting somewhere. So the really good news, and I know people have different opinions on whether we needed a new law. I spent hours talking with ministers in the House of Commons about whether we did or we didn't. <coughs> we're still on the fence. We do have brilliant law, but we're not applying it consistently or effectively. So actually now having something that we can say, yes, that is what this is. That's going to happen. It is going to be a deterrent, hopefully. So yes, the legislation will bring new guidance for courts and for police on how to handle this, and hopefully a better service for victims. Increase public awareness, we want people to come forward. Um, policy and reporting mechanisms, we're working with all of the social networks at the moment. They're all kind of saying, we realise this is a problem and it's our problem. We don't want people to be harassed on our sites, so they're introducing new streams in looking specifically about when it's these types of images. This is more than just a privacy issue, and it's quite hard to prove a harassment issue, so they're looking at it as a dedicated thing, which is great. Test cases and successes now with the use of DMCA, the copyright, you know, if you take a selfie, that's your picture. 
and you have the right to decide where it goes. <coughs> so we're seeing this, and it's getting a stronger argument, but as we said, there's still a very long way to go. Thank you. Victims with emotional and moral support. Uh, we recently launched a helpline and discover and vet resources for victims. So we refer them to takedown services, to lawyers that are taking those cases pro bono, and things like that. And basically, I, I developed our mission and I started the organization because I myself was a victim of a rent form. And when I tried to go to the police to get my case picked up, nobody would take it. I went to three different police stations and told them this has got to be harassment or cyber stalking or something. And I, I even printed the laws out and brought it in with me. And they said, nope, doesn't apply. Nope, you're, you don't fear for your life. Your physical safety isn't in danger. And I, was, I said, my livelihood is in danger here. I mean, this could destroy my professional future. And still, they, they wouldn't pay any attention. And as far as lawyers go, I was a graduate student at the time. I was up to my ears in student loans, and still am. And I didn't have hundreds of thousands of dollars laying around so that I could hire a lawyer to pursue this case. So I started this organization, and I developed the mission based on my own experience. And what I wanted to build is kind of a one-stop shop where victims could go and get everything that they need while they're going through this. So I knew that I needed, uh, I needed there to be new laws in place so that the police would actually pick up my case. I knew that I needed a therapist, counseling. I would not be standing and I wouldn't be sane today without having that, thank God, for free university counseling. And resources, I mean, really victims just want the pictures to come down. They wanna figure out how to make that happen and so, Takedown services, we've, we've partnered with a couple that are very, very good, and they charge victims next to nothing to get their pictures down because they feel for them. They understand that this is completely devastating, and they want to help further the cause. So I started End Revenge Porn and CCR in August of 2012. And to date, we've supported more than 2,000 victims, not just in the US, but all over the world. Uh, it's, it was really surprising to me when I first launched the campaign just how many victims I heard from in the UK, almost immediately. And then, as I said, we launched a helpline a couple of weeks ago. Uh, right now, we're, we're only able to take calls within the US due to uh, limits in funding. Um, but hopefully, we'll be able to expand that in the future. We've helped draft 22 state bills, a bill in D.C., and a federal bill against revenge porn, which, yeah, we struggle with uh, the terminology as well. And um, I know that the U.K. doesn't agree with this, but we prefer to call this non-consensual pornography because perpetrators aren't always motivated by revenge. Sometimes, as in the celebrity hacking case with Jennifer Lawrence, 
people obtain these pictures by hacking into the iCloud account or someone's computer, getting the pictures and putting them on the internet. That's not out of revenge, that's something else. Also, there are perpetrators that use this as a means of keeping victims in abusive relationships. They take photos without the victim's knowledge or, or they coerce them to take these photos. And then once they have them and the victim tries to leave the relationship to try to get out of the abusive relationship, then the perpetrator says, if you leave, I'm gonna share all these photos with your family. I'm gonna send them to your boss. I'm gonna post them online. And it forces them to stay. We've heard about this happening in human trafficking as well in order to keep the victims of human trafficking in the industry. So that's why we, we prefer to call it non-consensual pornography because revenge porn is a little limiting and just conjures up this notion that this only applies in situations where somebody's in a intimate relationship, they share the photos, somebody breaks up with the other, and then the other posts the photos out of revenge. It's not always the case. As I said, we, we've partnered with takedown services. Uh, one of them is DMCA Defender, and I can personally vouch for this service myself. I, as you can imagine, because I've gone public with my story, my material went completely viral, and it still gets posted to this day. And the takedown service is able to get those photos down like, almost immediately. And they also guarantee takedowns from myx.com, which is one of the most difficult sites to get material down from. And uh, they, they work with victims on, on the budgeting, on the pricing. And they understand that a lot of these victims are in college or they're just starting their first job, they don't have a lot of money. And so they figure out a price that works for them. And we also work with dmca.com. Uh, who actually helps guide victims through using DMCA takedown notices to get their material down. And finally, we also collaborate, just like Laura said, said that she does, with uh, search engines like Google, uh, social media companies, Facebook and Twitter, and other online platforms. And we work with them to inform them about how they can change their policies and their reporting processes in order to help victims of revenge porn or figure out a way to prevent this from happening in the future on their platforms. So Abolash asked me to talk about some of the challenges that we're facing in the US right now with this issue. One of the biggest issues that we face, and the biggest challenges, biggest hurdles in all areas of our work is the victim blaming that's involved in this. So you hear people saying, well, why did you take this picture in the first place? You should have known that this was going to happen to you. And this is basically just a new version of somebody telling a victim of sexual assault that they shouldn't have been wearing such a short skirt, that they shouldn't have had so much to drink, that they should have flirted with that guy. It's a really excuse their behavior. <clears throat> and so when we have people blaming the victims, they're not willing to do anything about it. Right? Because they say, this is on you. You got yourself into the situation. And in fact, um, there's a, an example in the, there was a California law that was passed in October of 2013. And in the law, they specifically did not cover cases in which the victims took the picture of themselves. They only covered cases in which someone else took the photo. And so they didn't cover selfies. And I, I called up the, the legislative drafter, and I, I managed to get him on the phone, and I was like, why? Why did you do that? How, how does that make sense? What, was your, what is your argument for that? And he told you, and I'm not lying. Um, he said, well, you know, if they took the pictures themselves, then I think that they were kind of asking for it, and they don't deserve as much protection as people who had their photo taken by someone else. And I, I was completely speechless. <laughs> um, so, and if, if you're still thinking, you know, people kind of are asking for this, then consider this. When you went to dinner last night and you ordered some new plates and a left blonde, and you gave the, the waiter your credit card to pay for your meal, then what if he had gone, to, or, or did you? Does that give him consent to go and? go on a shopping spree and buy a yacht. No, there's such thing as contextual
contextual consent here. You're consenting to sharing these pictures with one person. You're not consenting to them sharing it with the entire world. And you're certainly not consenting to them putting up those pictures with your personal identifying information, which incites harassment and stalking. Another challenge that we face is the freedom of speech. Now, I'm sure a lot of you have heard about this argument. Um, so many of our opponents are freedom of speech advocates, and they're worried about these laws and that they would impose on the freedom of speech, and that they would uh, they would s stop speech that is supposed to advance our society. <coughs> Well, we have two law professors on our board, and our legislative and, uh, what's her title? And tech, no, sorry, let's just say legislative director, okay? The one who is helping to draft the laws across the US. They're both free speech advocates. They don't want to write bad laws. They don't want to write laws that are gonna be declared unconstitutional later down the road. Then what's the point? You know, we're, we're doing this work to protect victims. We wanna put good laws in place. And so they've done a lot of research on how to write these laws so that they don't impose on the freedom of speech. And this includes carving out exceptions for these laws, which ensure that the important lawful speech that advances our society doesn't get swept up into this law. So this is a little diagram to show you what kinds of exceptions we're including to make sure that these laws don't impose on the freedom of speech. And I know this is kind of hard to read, but it says effective revenge porn laws are narrowly tailored so as not to sweep up expressive con conduct vital to a free society. So such exceptions as lawful public purpose, lawful criminal investigations, all these things would not fall under the law and be criminal. Images depicting voluntary exposure in public or commercial settings, reporting on lawful conduct. If you guys have any questions about what these are, you can ask later. We just don't <coughs> um, another thing that Avalash said, uh, and, and that's actually in the description of this session, is that some people argue that the civil route is the better way to go. And I talked a little bit about this before in my own case. Victims don't have hundreds of thousands of dollars laying around. Right now, we are collaborating with uh, a law firm, the law firm K&L Gates, to provide victims with pro bono legal services around the world, actually. They have also offices all, all over the world. But there aren't gonna be lawyers that can take these cases pro bono forever. And CDA 230 prevents lawyers from being able to go after the websites which would give them a roundabout way of getting paid for taking on these cases. And these cases are just, they're a lot of work. I mean, you can imagine all of the, uh, the technology that you have to understand in order to track down these perpetrators. And now with the existence of VPNs that allow you to cover up your IP address, makes it, it can make it nearly impossible to track some of the perpetrators. So you think the lawyers know how to do this? It's a lot of work to put into a case that they're not gonna get paid for. And uh, that's why, that's one of the reasons that we argue that criminal law is the way to go. Another reason is victims don't want money. They want this to have not happened in the first place. Once those pictures are online, they're up there forever. I know we're working with takedown services and. And a lot of times they are very successful in getting the photos down, but they have to keep taking them down. Victims have to keep paying the service so that they can continue to search their names and make sure that they can down. Victims want to prevent this from happening in the first place. And criminal law is the best way to deter this kind of behavior. Perpetrators aren't afraid of being sued. A lot of them don't have money. They're afraid of going to jail. And finally, I touched on this a little bit, um, law enforcement and attorney resources are uh, very lacking, both in tech savviness and knowledge and, uh, and manpower, basically. So that's just a, another challenge that we're facing now and I'm sure we're gonna face in the future. So 
I'd love to hear any ideas that you all have or my co-presenters have about how to, how to do this. I thought about outsourcing uh, computer forensics teams so that the attorneys and the police don't have to do that work. Maybe that's a way to go. Finally, I just wanted to end with a lovely quote from Gabrielle Union, who was a victim of uh, the, the hackings, of the, her new photos got hacked and posted. And this is a message to victims. You might feel like you're alone on an island. You're not. Talk to people who care for you. Just keep going. Whatever your dreams were before, they still remain. You might feel like nothing will ever be the same. And that's true. Nothing will be the same. Take that and change. in order to perhaps look at the larger problems that revenge porn as a genre has to offer. 
Um, it is important to recognize that while more and Evans are being criminally charged, the case against them was not won on grounds of moral reprehensibility, innovation of privacy, enabling hate speech or violence against women. It wasn't even won on the grounds of protectionism or safety and security for the victim. The case was won because it was successfully argued and proved that Moore and Evans had hacked into Kayla Laws' computer, taken images of her which she had not put into circulation herself. These weren't spy cam images captured by a third party and posted on Is Anyone Up, thus acquitting Moore and Evans of any responsibility. They were found guilty of directly stealing these images and were convicted them with charges of data theft and copyright infringement. So I want to take this particular judgment and the entire discourse surrounding revenge pornography and its control to make a proposition that so far the demands for regulation of revenge porn have been about the objectives of revenge porn. They invoke the ways in which revenge porn humiliates, shames, threatens, and in some cases leads to fatal attacks on victims who are betrayed both by the men who produce and consume these digital objects as well as the technologies <coughs> that distribute and circulate them. These for me are old challenges. If you look at the history of women's rights and sexuality movements across the world, uh, these challenges have leapfrogged across centuries and technologies as different cultures have tried to control the appearance of female bodies and the desires of these, or desires of these bodies. Now, I have a friend called Louis Webb who is a classicist who studies second century Rome and who talks about how slut shaming and revenge pornography as evidences and narratives of how women were being constructed in second century Rome as well. Right? So it's not a new problem that we are facing, and that's kind of important. So I want to suggest then that along with these existing demands about controlling the objectives and providing safeguards against its intentions, we might perhaps want to look at the objects of revenge war. I'm proposing today that the basic problem in trying to understand, analyze, predict, regulate, or control revenge pornography has been a systemic and structural misunderstanding of the objects through which revenge pornography operates. And I offer multiple intersections between hardware and software studies, network studies, and cultural studies to locate the blind spots of formal analysis in our growing discourse around revenge porn. At the formal level, the revenge porn object becomes so difficult to comprehend and control because it's not the same as the older image. They are not even the same as older digital images. The problem with revenge porn objects is not that they are obscene or intrusive or outside of the control of regulatory mechanisms. Because these are old problems and there are actually robust resolutions being engineered to cope with them. The fundamentally new problem that revenge porn presents to us is that of leakage. They leak from online to offline, creating hybrid spaces of violence where the digital images map onto the physical body. In the cases of Kayla Laws, or indeed the notorious case of fappening and the leaking of naked pictures of Hollywood actor Jennifer Lawrence, the case is perhaps easier to be made because the content is so violent. <coughs> because it deals with naked bodies, it deals with libidinal perversions, it deals with masturbatory rape cultures of exposure and shame that we seem to kind of gratify and embody within the digital web. Hence the call for regulation and control of how these objects would be leaked and many solutions which are presented there are kind of easier to make is my proposition. The real challenge is going to be when leakage is not understood as an exception, but as the very nature of digital objects. So we are not concentrating on objects that leak and ooze sexuality or what would be called obscene material, thus trying to take away the pathologization of revenge porn or the objects around it. And we're not concentrating uh, on objects as things which are leaked, but things which leak in themselves. Right? Because all the safeguards which we have called for right now uh, depend entirely on the idea that if we stop the circulation of these objects, if we stop them from leaking, then we might be reaching somewhere. Because leakage is an essential condition of all digital things, and it leads into slut shaming practices very easily. Um, take, for example, this particular Facebook case of women eating on the London tube. I don't know if you're familiar with that. There's apparently a Facebook page which has pictures of women eating on the London Metro. Yeah? So you eat on the train, there is a perv who takes a picture of you, it goes online, there is nothing sexual about it, there is nothing obscene about it, but it has more than 1.2 million hits when people look at these women and say, you slut, you dirty little thing, how dare you come into the train and eat? 
Right. Um, I just wanted to kind of make this point, saying that revenge pornography is not essentially only about naked pictures of people or selfies, but it seems to be registering some sort of a backlash against the public appearance of private bodies of women. Yeah. That what that it's not just going to be about the content, but what these pictures are going to be used for. That these women on the women meeting on a tube Facebook are still identified derided, mocked and shamed, not for the sexual bodies, but apparently for the fact that their private bodies are now available in public. Wendy Chan uh, reminds us that it is this habit of leakage between the online of the, and the offline, of the personal and the public, the presence of the person in the public as a catalyst for converting her into an object of violent sexual consumption that revenge porn embodies. So Hunter Moore, uh, he, in an interview following the attention to the legal case, actually said that he thought that the women on his website being exposed were sluts, not because they were sexual, but because they were stupid. And he said they were stupid enough to appear in public, they were stupid enough to trust the men around them, and they were stupid enough to actually use technologies. If they hadn't done it, right? So if they had stayed in their houses, if they had worn tin foil hands and never used technologies, and if they had had no direct contact with men, they would not have been exposed. This recognition of uh, revenge porn as leaking and potentially creating any public body as fair game for slut shaming and sexual abuse allows us to perhaps shift attention from the object as being leaked to the object as essentially leaking. Uh, when we understand the object of revenge porn as an object that leaks, we might start thinking about it not as a finite, discrete, complete, one-time object, but an object that constantly leaks and connects. Especially given the accelerated rate of updating on the social web, each image is only a placeholder for the images that shall come and replace them. So you could go to take down services, you could get your pictures removed, but you know for more than ever that they are just going to resurface and come back. And so our uh, calls for regulation are not going to be just about that one image, that one website, that one act of privacy invasion, but about a larger regime of data control and management. The regulation around revenge porn has to find intersections with regimes of data authorization, management, access, storage, and indeed leakage in our control and surveillance societies. What would it give us, for instance, if we thought of the leaking pornography activity as an act of whistleblowing? If we were confronted with a WikiLeaks for porn, because that's what some of the advocates are actually making an argument around. The second proposition I have is to think of digital objects as objects of circulation. The established discourse is that there are certain actors, human or technological, which circulate these objects beyond their context, intention, and design. The assumption is that if we find a way by which these routes of circulation can be monitored, we will be able to enforce the policies and laws around revenge pornography more effectively. In physical computation, a network is not a predefined thing, though. It's something that comes into being temporarily as traffic moves from one point to the other, thus becoming an edge. A series of edges, when repeatedly used for delivery of traffic, constitutes a network. The network has no form, no morphology, no fixed structure. It grows and shrinks and cannot really be regulated. In fact, the network, in order to survive, needs a constant circulation of traffic, even if it is redundant traffic, and hence encourages us to generate, share, and circulate as much information and data as we can produce to fill up the potential edges that the network is constantly supporting. Um, I quickly wanted to kind of quote two people saying Duncan Watts and Philip A. they both the fathers of uh, digital physical computing, who both kind of insist that the network is a falsehood. It is a graphical reduction that hides the fact that circulation of traffic is not something that a network performs. Circulation of a traffic is what constitutes the network. And hence, trying to regulate circulation within a network seems to be antithetical to the very structure and architecture of it. We need to then perhaps stop thinking about revenge porn as discrete objects traveling on the network because that gives rise to the idea that if we regulate um, the edges, the routes of circulation, the websites and portals, they will be able to restrict the circulation <coughs> and access of these objects. That is counterintuitive to the life, counterintuitive to the life of digital objects. And yet this is exactly the kind of regulation that's being demanded about the big data life of revenge porn, archives and databases. I want to end by suggesting that what we might need to think of is intersections of hardware, software, networks, and cultural practice to understand the objects of revenge pornography before we set out to regulate them. 
In the case of shutting down of this any of PrepCom, it's clear that while it's a great symbolic victory, it doesn't do anything to address the alarming growth of revenge porn on the web. Every user-generated content site, every microblogging network like Twitter, and now the phone-based apps like Secret are filled with revenge pornography content that gets aggregated, curated, distributed, and circulated, all for the network to survive. Understanding this process of circulation as the basic architecture of the web allows us to perhaps shift the debates of revenge pornography away, away from technological control and machine regulation and bring it back to what is at stake, which is questions of the body. And I'm going to stop here. Thank you. Um, 
Um, we also have a variety of different state legislators in the United States. You have California, which is a professional legislature. They're in session a large period of the year. They're dealing with all sorts of technology and privacy issues. Let's say you go across the country to North Dakota. It's not quite the same. And so in some states, there are the resources there uh, in order to create laws, in order to reach out to victims' organizations and make sure that laws are comprehensive. Also to make sure laws are providing redress in the criminal and in the civil sense. In other states, getting this on the docket can take over two to four years. And so we do face challenges in that it is very hard to get the attention of certain legislators, um, which then puts the laws in the pipeline several years out. Next slide. Um, so the good thing is that states are probably legislating around not consensual reform. Several years ago, this was not the case. Um, right now, there are 15 states in the U.S. that do have laws that are not consensual reform. Most of them have decided to go down the criminal route. Unfortunately, um, some states only make this behavior a misdemeanor, and so it's a mere slap on the wrist. Other states are being more aggressive. Uh, currently in Florida, actually, um, State Representative Tom Goodson has, a, has put forth a law that would make it a felony. And so some states are taking this activity very seriously. Um, they're being very particular to define um, what activity does fall under the law. Um, it's been very easy for law enforcement in the past to turn to a victim and say, well, you know, our, our current laws don't really cover this, or we don't see how it covers this, and so guess what? We don't have anything we can do for you. And so one of the challenges for organizations working in this space in the U.S. is to make sure that it's as clear as day that this particular behavior falls under the law, and these are the consequences for that behavior. Um, we're also seeing state attorney general's office in the U.S. Um, take the lead. Uh, in California, Attorney General Kamala Harris um, has dedicated uh, resources to an e-crimes unit as well as work with victims' organizations. Um, I'm even part of a panel on February 4th to talk specifically about non-consensual porn. And so she has made a commitment by getting resources in her office to ensure that we are cracking down on these cases and that victims do have a place to go. Um, again, though, California is a large state with a lot of resources. You go to other states in the U.S., you're not going to find the same thing. Um, particularly when this comes to cross-border problems. I mean, this is the internet. People are very mobile these days with work and everything else. Something happens in one state, you move to another. It is still confusing, you know, what laws would apply, where you should go, and how local law enforcement would jump in to help you. Uh, next slide. Um, many of the statutes uh, that do exist, um, I'll just keep clicking. Yeah, so, all right. Um, that concerns cyberstalking and internet harassment. Um, they've been somewhat useful for victims, um, but it really has been about carve-outs and, and defining what exactly the behavior is uh, and what, uh, what the behavior we look to diagnose is in these particular laws. And so that's where it's very important for victims' rights organizations and lawyers to work together. I know people shudder working with lawyers on different matters, but there are lawyers out there who want to make sure these laws are specific and that they can aid the local prosecutor's office in making sure that victims will be protected. Um, in California, I'm pleased to announce that um, you know, we are currently undergoing a prosecution of the purveyor of YouGotHosted.com. Um, that trial is currently underway in San Diego in California. And so you are seeing uh, those who have hosted websites where they are making a profit, they are using an extortion model of charging victims $300 to $500 to remove images, you are now seeing them get prosecuted. And I'm hoping that this will have the effect of preventing other people from engaging in such behavior. Uh, next slide. Um, the bad thing is it is 50 states, it's 50 different approaches. Um, my organization wants to make sure that every state does have an approach, but if there was a federal approach, if there was federal guidance from one of our federal agencies on you know, what uh, constitutes this behavior, um, you know, how there are guidelines for companies and law enforcement, that would be really helpful. Because a key challenge is law enforcement not knowing what to do. Um, you know, we've been really lucky working in certain jurisdictions like Colorado. You have people who have educated themselves on the issue and reached out to victims' organizations. But on average, many people don't even know what this is and, and don't have any resources to tackle it. And so you're basically, as the victim, going in and educating law enforcement on how you need help. And that shouldn't be the case. Uh, my organization, without my consent, um, is making sure that we actually provide education resources, workshops, um, both on and offline, to educate law enforcement so that we can at least uh, bridge that education gap and make sure that as the laws do hit the books, there are the proper means to enforce them. Uh, next slide. 
Um, so federal action on non-consensual porn and online harassment, standardization is something that we're really trying to look at right now. Um, it's increasingly difficult <coughs> as we do have a Congress that changes every two years. Calling a bill through Capitol Hill um, can be a challenge. Um, we also are currently dealing with the Congress of the United States where women's issues are not exactly going too well right now. And so trying to push a bill around non-consensual form when people think this is a woman's issue even though it's not. Uh, it affects both males and females. It affects people of all walks of life. Um, has been increasingly difficult to get someone who will help us shepherd that through uh, the House or the Senate. Uh, next slide. Um, there are federal litigation tools, though, and I kind of want to talk about some uh, unique litigation strategies um, that victims have employed. Um, one is copyright law. Um, so as the images uh, you know, are, are, are normally something that's either hacked into on someone's computer or someone has taken it themselves or they're in the actual image, they can try to claim a copyright. Trademark law has also been used. Um, our big challenge, though, is to wrap this up um, since we are running out of time is the Communications Decency Act. Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act is what has allowed many of our internet companies to flourish. Simply put, it allows for user-generated content to go up on platforms and it insulates those companies. Um, that is a big challenge for us. And that's where you see First Amendment advocates and Section 230 advocates butting heads with victims' <coughs> rights advocates and, and attorneys on, on our side is that where is that proper balance? Should there be carve out to Section 230? Um, are we going to jeopardize Section 230 and all the good it does because people are, are operating in bad actors? Um, so that's really our challenge right now is, and I think that's where the debate is settled, and I think that's where you're going to see the federal debate in the U.S. is going to be around Section 230 and if there should be carve outs. And I think that's going to be an extended conversation because it's not just non consensual porn. Um, <coughs> we're talking about problems in Section 230, it's a host of other issues. Um, and lastly, just, and I'll just forget the slides at this point. Um, legal developments to track uh, state attorney general's offices in the U.S. are one of the best resources that we have in terms of having um, dedicated points of contact to deal with these issues. Many of them, including New York, are being more proactive on non-consensual porn. Um, and I hope that you know, our organization is putting together a 50-state compendium of laws. And so as uh, more laws hit the book, we hope that we can give resources to victims who do have issues. We can point them um, to the right place. So thank you very much.
question, which is, it seems like what's happening to us is not as sexy as <coughs> what's happening. And so, but where's my recourse? I'm getting harassed, I'm getting docs, things are happening to me, and I have no recourse. Where in the law is this? Where do I find this? And I think that is a continuing difficulty. And so, um, for us, I think online harassment, that definition of this needs to be broadened. And part of that's going to be um, you know, individuals bringing cases, but also educating law enforcement. I mean, I've had conversations with law enforcement on behalf of the victims that I'm trying to work with, kind of explaining it to them. First of all, they're just, they have no idea what's going on technology-wise and kind of how all these pieces play together. Um, and then they also just don't necessarily see the direct harm. And so all this is happening on Twitter, well, well, well it's not happening to somebody physically. It, I mean, it's 2015. Like, it might as well be. It's targeting people's reputation. People are scared to go online. They're scared to interact in spaces where everyone interacts today. And so really, I think a lot of it is, one, working with law enforcement, educating them on what it is and what it means. But two, also state legislatures. I mean, a lot of what goes into these laws has legislative history and conversations. Um, and you know, I'm really sorry, being a Californian, Holly, that you call one of my legislators, and that was the attitude that you got. Like, that's deplorable. So I think a lot of it is is education. I think that's why organizations like that, my consent, the Hollywood organization have to exist. It's just, you know, we're at the beginning of what's going to be a bit of an uphill battle. Cool. Just so a non-legal view on this. So I work really closely with Twitter. Uh, many of you will probably know that over the last 18 months in the UK, there were some very high-profile cases of trolling, which were eventually kind of dealt with. One of them was dealt with actually as a kind of stalking and harassment issue, and the other was more along the malicious, malicious communications. Um, interesting, the kind of anatomy of all of those cases, and something we struggle with time and time again. So the first thing is society gets involved about just saying, do you know what? This doesn't actually have to meet the criteria of being a criminal. It's just really horrible and unpleasant, and we're not going to put up with it. But what tends to happen, and unfortunately, you know, I am definitely not going to be this here, because I think I might be one myself, but, you know, this whole thing of, I'm just going to retweet every abusive thing you send me, because I think that's empowering, without actually reporting it to the social network. Criticise the social network for not being responsible, but if they're not, if you're not actually doing the tools that they have and following the procedures, it doesn't help them. They're going to try and help you, but you do need to take the relevant steps rather than just shouting about it, saying, "Oh, it's a terrible and it's abuse." We all need to do it. And the one thing I'm really, really pushing for is kind of this social responsibility. Everyone look out for everyone else. Now, one of the things that we've been advising all of the social networks, and most of them are adopting it. You used to have to be the person in an image or the person whose privacy was being breached if we're talking doxing on the internet to report it. What they're all now looking at is saying, do you know what, anyone can report it. So if anyone sees something that they think shouldn't be there that is abusive or threatening or harmful, they will report it, do something about it. I have a quick question. On the legal paradigm within the UK and the US, is, does any jurisdiction take a, uh, more of a child pornography uh, framework of making it illegal the possession of this, of this material, or is it only for distribution? In five minutes, it's time for the other session. <laughs> Certainly, the perspective from the UK, so our partners are the Internet Watch Foundation, who are one of the leading organisations in Hotline's taking down, working with entities to remove harmful content. They have said there is no way that they want these images to become criminal, because it would just be too big a noise. Underage victims, who so go to the police to try to get help because they're victims of non criminal pornography. And the police have told them, okay, I, I can take your case, especially because it's child pornography, but you may get charged for possession and distribution of child pornography. Well, yeah. I think that's the challenge for school districts in the U.S. as well. Um, you know, this has become a big issue with minors in the U.S., and the administrators are, and teachers are just they're kind of stuck because they understand the law and they explain it to students and they have to kind of be upfront, like once you give me your phone, once I see those images, there's just a whole legal conundrum even there in school districts. And that's kind of the logical first place for a kid to go is talk to a teacher and administrator. Last question? It might be more of an observation, but um, I've done some work recently on female genital mutilation and 40 years of legislation didn't work. And the recommendations we got in the Rights Committee was some civil um, procedures. And you talk about not going down the civil route, but actually what you might, you might want to think about is 
similar system to the Sexual Offences Prevention Order, and there's some success in Australia with what's called domestic violence orders. So for those identifiable perpetrators who put the stuff on the net, that it's very simple form-filling exercise that an individual can fill in, post a court themselves, saying this is the person, this is what they've done, and it puts the duty on that person. You'd be amazed how many people admit that they have done it. So in terms of the identifiable person posting, uh, and it puts the duty on them to take, you have a takedown order in civil proceedings. So I think one of the things to look at the experience of the FGM history, which has been ignored in the same way as this is being ignored or treated as a, as a woman's problem, it is to look at sort of creative ways of, uh, of placing the responsibility on the person that posted them. One of the, yeah, first, things, one of the first things we explore in the UK is people think it's really, really hard. I mean, in America, I think we're more used to civil action and stuff. In the UK, we just don't do that. Or it's really difficult or expensive. It costs about 85 pounds to go and apply for an injunction. And of course, if they then breach that injunction, they are then breaking the law. Yeah. And so we got, do handhold people that through that process. Sanction. Yeah. And, um, I mean, I happen to have an issue with court fees. I think 85 pounds is a lot of money. Um, but you've got that sanction that uh, if they don't do what they're required to do under the order, uh, then they go to prison and that's what they're fighting on. So I, I think that's what the idea of civil procedures is. Yes, and also that otherwise you come up against greater revenge because of the threat. So Unfortunately, we have to leave it there. I encourage you all to bring your questions and discussions to lunch in an hour and a half.